So if you will, this morning, uh, we're going to be looking in 2 John, and we're going to take a look at the power of a living testimony, the power of a living testimony, which is walking in truth, walking in love. You know, the, the Apostle John speaks often about truth love and light, uh, and I want to make that distinction between the truth and walking in the truth. Uh, truth, it, it, it's a concept, it's, it's facts, it's what is real, but walking in the truth is taking that truth and living it out and applying it into your life, and that's what I would like for us to do this morning. You know, now more than ever, it's so important that we speak the truth, uh, but it is also important that we live the truth in our lives, that the way we behave matches what we say. And I would like us to notice this morning that it is the unity that we possess in our love for God and His truth that brings us together. So if you will, Look in Second John. We're going to be going through the whole book, although it's only 13 verses. And if you will, if you, if you can, please let's stand for the reading of the word. We're going to look in the first three verses. And scripture says, The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth for the sake of the truth, which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Let us bow for prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we, we praise you. You are so good this morning. And, and Lord, I, I stand here, I admit, I'm unworthy to, to be speaking of these things. Lord, in my life, I don't love the way I know I ought to. Um, but Lord, I, I have to proclaim your word, your message. I pray that you would allow the truth of your scripture to transform us, transform our minds, and that we would recall that you have given us this great commission, Lord, to go out to speak the truth, but also to, to live the truth, to love people that you created in your image and that you died for on the cross. So we praise you, we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. You know, the, the author of 2 John, which should come as no surprise to anyone, is the Apostle John. This fact is unanimous among early church fathers, your Ignatius, Polycarp, Papias, and Irenaeus, and so on. That's the external evidence, but there's also internal evidence. Um, all three of the epistles of John in the New Testament um, have similar themes to the Gospel of John, themes of love, of light, and truth. Um, and it's specifically this love, John is known as the Apostle of Love. And in his Gospel, he only refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He just could not get over the fact that Jesus loved him. And not in some sort of impersonal way, right? Um, God loves the world. That's true. But he loves you individually. He loved John, and that just blew him away. 
And so I want to take a look here in the beginning of 2 John, and we're going to see that this love that, that John was just blown away by, uh, not only did he return that love to God, but he loved God's people, and that unites us in that love. So let's take a look again in uh, 2 John verse 1. It says, The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth for the sake of the truth, which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Here we see that the recipient of the letter is the chosen lady and her children. Um, and in the, this past semester, the uh, spring semester in New Testament, our class, we had to dig deep into these epistles and read different uh, opinions on who, who maybe the recipients were. It's very possible John was writing to a, a woman and her family, her children. That's, that's one possibility. Uh, another possibility is maybe the elect lady, this chosen lady, was someone who uh, housed the church in her home. Maybe she was wealthy and uh, her children refers to the church. Or it could just be the elect lady is a church. You know, during this time, there was heavy persecution on the church. Uh, leading up to, but especially with the Emperor Nero, uh, Christians were killed for their faith. And then in 70 AD, you had the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. And so it wasn't safe to be giving out names and locations of churches. And so it's very likely that John was ambiguous in this letter for that very reason, to protect the recipients. But we see that in verse 1, that he loves the people he's writing to in truth, and that he is not alone in this love, but as it states, not only I, but also all who know the truth. You know, this morning, I'm looking out at, at faith, and I see a congregation, and, and those listening in online as well, um, there's a reason why we come together here at, at Faith Baptist Church. And it's not because we all come from the same hometown, or uh, that we share the same ethnicity, or that we like the same food, or sadly, that we all like the same sports team. I know that's not true at all. Uh, there's so much hate for my Lions in this room. <laughs> but the reason why we are here this morning is because we have a Redeemer. We have a Savior. We have heard the gospel message, the message of truth, and we are united in that truth and in that love that's why we're here. It's not a social club. Um, you know, it's not a place where we can come together and enjoy baked goods. Although we do all those things, those things are wonderful. Um, but we're here for one reason and one reason only. And that unity is something that I pray for this morning in this church. And not only this church, but the church in general. Right now, there's much division, specifically in this nation. Um, but I don't want us to forget why we're here. Our identity is in Jesus and Jesus alone. You know, the Bible says there's only two categories of people. Those who are in Adam and those who are in Christ. That's it. Those are the only options. And in verse 3 tells us that this identity, this redemption, this shared grace and mercy 
comes only from God by way of his truth and his love. So not only are we united in the truth, but John tells us we need to be walking in the truth. This brings us to the occasion of the letter. John there in verse 4 says, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. You know, John had an encounter with some members of this church that he was writing to, and he was greatly encouraged to find them walking in the truth. There's many people today who name the name of Christ that say, oh, yes, I'm a Christian. But it's because maybe their parents are believers or maybe uh, they, they went to church a few times as a child. But when you have been redeemed, when you've had an encounter with the risen Lord, you cannot help but be changed. And this process of walking in the truth is known as sanctification. None of us are perfect, but John met these brothers and sisters from this church, and he was so greatly encouraged by their faith, not only their theology, not only their doctrine, but it matched the way they lived their life. And whenever we conduct ourselves in a consistent manner with the word of Scripture, not only does that serve as a living testimony to those outside of the church, but it also greatly encourages and builds up our fellow believers as well. Have you ever known someone that just the way they lived their life was so encouraging to you? It just, it fires you up. I mean, I can think of a few people in this room right now that have that effect on me. Um, in John 15, verses 12 and 13, Jesus told his disciples, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. That is that example of radical love, that example of living out the truth. It's not just something that lives up here in your head, but it is who you are. It has changed who you are. And so, first we see here, walking in the truth requires love. Walking in the truth requires love. In verse 5, John says, Now I ask you, lady... Not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we've had from the beginning, that we love one another. The first requirement of walking in the truth is that we have love for one another. You cannot say that you're walking in the truth, but you turn around and treat your brothers and sisters in Christ with hate or contempt or jealousy. Um, and I'll be the first one to admit, uh, it, it's a weakness, but some people are easier to love than others. <laughs> it's just true, right? Um, but I think that's a weakness in us. I don't think it's a weakness in anybody else. Um, but we know through the word of Scripture that God is no respecter of persons. He sees all of us as equal. There's no such thing as a second-class Christian. And the thing we need to remind ourselves is, is that we're no great prize ourselves, that Jesus died because of our sins also. And when we remember that, it humbles us, right? We recall that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and he died for that person's sins also. And then we 
have that capacity to love them as we ought to. Um, you know, when you truly love someone, you find that you start loving the people that they love also. Whenever I first met my lovely wife, I started going over to her grandfather's house so I could spend time with her. And as I began falling in love with her, I fell in love with her grandfather also, albeit in a different way. Uh, but Evie loved her grandfather, Papa, as we all called him, so greatly. And it was just natural. I loved the things, the people that she loved because I loved her so much, I couldn't help but love her family as well. And in that same in that same thing, those of us who love God, we need to love the people that God loves as well. That should be second nature to us. And this makes sense. How can we say we love God but live our lives in total rebellion against everything that God calls us to do? But we need to be in a pattern of submitting our will to his will. That's that process of sanctification. Uh, Jesus, in, in the Gospel of John, was praying for his disciples, and he said, Father, sanctify them with your truth. Your word is truth. So we see if we want to be sanctified, we need to bathe ourselves in the truth, bathe ourselves in in God's word. In John 15, verses 14 and 15, Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father, I have been made known. I have made known to you. You know, Abraham was called a friend of God. Why? Because he believed God, yes, but he also obeyed God. He believed the promises that God made to him about leading him into a land and giving him a son and blessing his offspring. But it wasn't just something he believed in his head. He believed it in his heart because he followed, he left his family. He didn't even know where he was going, but he went and he was faithful to God. And also he offered up his son, Isaac, the son that even his wife at first didn't believe would happen. I mean, they were so old, but God is faithful and he gave them a son. And when God asked him to offer him on the, an altar, he did, praise God. God provided the sacrifice instead. And 2,000 years ago, God provided the sacrifice for our sins as well. And so walking in the truth requires love. And it is evidenced by obedience. I've been preaching at, at Victory a series through the book of James. And the book of James is all about practicing what you preach. You know, there's a, a verse where uh, James says, faith without works would, is, is dead, is a dead faith. And that's, a, that's kind of a controversial verse because so many people take it out of context. But what James is saying is, you can't just have this profession of faith. And then when you see a brother or sister in need, just walk past them without providing that need. So, we, walking in the truth requires love, but is also evidenced by obedience. But the next thing I want to take a look at this morning is John tells us to be running away from lies. So we need to walk in the truth, but we need to run away from lies. The enemy of our souls is a liar and the father of lies, scripture says. 
The first lie ever recorded in Scripture was when he told Eve, you will not die. If you eat of the fruit, you're not going to die. You're going to become like God. And his tactics haven't changed since. And so one of the most dangerous things that a church faces is not a threat from outside of the church, but it can be a threat from within the church, from those who seek to deceive by not promoting the truth, but by deceiving and telling lies. So there in verse 7, John tells us that deceivers deny the incarnation. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not uh, acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, this is the deceiver and the antichrist. You know, one of the first heretical groups that the church had to face and overcome was that of the Gnostics. And the Gnostics were kind of like the Plato of heretics. Has anyone here played with Plato as a child? Right? You take your Plato, you know, I, I like to go up to a newspaper and stamp it on the newspaper and then you peel it back and then whatever's on the newspaper is written on the Plato. But it happens to everybody at some point you're playing with Play-Doh and it, you drop it. And then when you pick it up, there's all this stuff in it, all this junk, whatever is on the floor, maybe you're playing with it outside and you'll never get it all out of there. It, it's like ruined now. And Gnosticism kind of did that same thing. It kind of took elements of, of uh, Platonism and Judaism and Christianity and all sorts of weird like, private interpretations of scripture. But one of the main things, one of the main doctrines of Gnosticism was a dualistic nature of, of the world. There's the physical world and then there's the spiritual world. And everything in the spiritual world is good but everything in the physical world is evil. So Jesus, he couldn't have came in a physical body because that would make him evil, right? And so whenever Jesus uh, was on the cross, the Gnostics say he only seemed to be on the cross. He only seemed to have a physical body. The early church father, Ignatius, responded by saying that the Gnostics only seem to be Christians, but in fact, they are devils. So deceivers deny the incarnation, and, and we, don't, we don't have Gnostics necessarily today, but there are many who deny the incarnation of Christ. They deny whether he really existed um, you know, that, that they're just stories told, they're, you know, to, to a moral people, they're moral stories, but uh, they deny that he ever came in the flesh. This is dangerous because if Jesus didn't come in the flesh, then he wasn't crucified in the flesh on the cross. And if he wasn't crucified, then there wasn't a body to be resurrected. And as Paul stated if the, in, in 1 Corinthians, if there's no resurrection, then we are still dead in our sins and without hope and of among all men most to be pitied. Next in verse 8, we see that the deceiver's message is seductive. John tells us, watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. The reason why John says watch yourselves is because deception, the lie, can be seductive. And the reason why it's seductive is because they like to pack it in with a little bit of truth. 
when Evie and I lived in Missouri, we had our home, and we had a family of groundhogs move in. And they weren't just on the property, they wanted to live right underneath our house. Well, I, I couldn't have that. I mean, they could damage the foundation of our home. And so I went and borrowed a live trap, and I got some watermelon rinds, and I used that as the bait, and I caught one. Yes, I got one. It was a little baby, that's all right. So I took it down to the creek outside of town, come back, all right, let's catch another one. Problem was, they caught wise to what I was doing. I tried watermelon, cantaloupe, all kinds of things, didn't work. So then I decided, aha, I'm gonna get them with the cage. It's the trap without a cage that's rat poison. And boy, did they eat it up. They tore into the bag. I put some out for them to get to and they didn't just settle for that. They got into the bag, ate the whole bag up. I'm like, you stupid groundhogs, you're in for it. Problem was, it didn't affect them. I'm telling you, a couple of days went by, nothing. They were all still there. And then uh, my wife said, you know what? Why don't we use the live trap, but let's use some of that rat poison as bait. And let me tell you, we caught three groundhogs in one day <laughs> using the rat poison. And the rat poison, 98% of it is good food. I mean, 98% you could eat and be totally fine. But it's that 2% is what kills you. It's that poison that slipped into the good food. And heresy is the same way. Oftentimes, deceivers will slip that little bit of poison along with some truth to make it palatable. And that's why we need to watch ourselves. We need to beware. And it, it brings to mind how um, the government tries to spot fake money. You know, whenever the, they train people to find fake money, they don't give them all the different bills that people try, that make and try to pass off as, as real money. Instead, what they do is that they make them study the genuine article. They become so familiar with the way money should look that whenever a fake bill slips by, it sticks out like a sore thumb. And so the Bible tells us we need to bathe ourselves in the truth, in the word of God. We need to be studying it, rightly dividing the word of truth. That way, whenever heresy comes along, we can identify it. No, that's not true. And I'm not talking about maybe a difference in opinion. You know, when it comes to the, the rapture, some people are pre-tribulation or mid-trib, post-trib. You know, we can debate on those things. Uh, those things are important, but they're secondary issues, right? But where we cannot compromise is the gospel, is the fundamental truths that make us who we are, the person and the work of Christ. Every heretical group, every cult that exists in the world, they err in one or more ways on that person and work of Christ. And so we need to watch ourselves But then John kind of shifts a little bit and we see in verse nine that believers have the son. So we know deceivers deny the incarnation, that their message is seductive, but he makes the distinction believers have the son. In verse nine, John says, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. But the one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. You cannot deny the person or work of Jesus and still have the Father. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
no one comes to the Father but through me. The Jews at the time, they wanted to say, yeah, we, we have the Father. You know, he is our God. But they denied Jesus, the Son of God, whom the Father sent. You cannot have both. There's so many people that have an issue with the exclusivity of the gospel. Why is Jesus the only way? Why can't he just be a way, right? I mean, why can't Christians get to heaven through Jesus and, you know, Muslims get through to heaven through the, the Quran and, and so on and so forth? But that's asking the wrong question. The real question we should be asking is why would God even provide one way for us to, to get to him? Man is so centered on himself, and we forget that man who God created from the dust of the ground has rebelled against his creator, the all-powerful, holy God, it's amazing that God would save even one of us and that he would do it by sacrificing his only son. It's outrageous. It's scandalous. But this is the depth of his love for us. And John also tells us that believers abide in the truth. They have the son and they abide in his truth. Those who endure to the end are those who have the Son and the Father. There are many people, when the church is per being persecuted, and I believe that time is coming here in America too, where it's no longer gonna be safe to be a Christian. But in those times, there will be some who fall away. There's many prominent people, worship leaders, songwriters today that are falling away. They're apostatizing from the faith. And it's not that they were saved and that they're no longer saved, but that they were never saved in the first place. First John chapter 2, verse 19 says, They went out from us, but they were never really saved of us. So John commands us, he says, you need to abide in the truth. Don't just um, sit on your laurels. You know, man, I used to be a really religious person. I can't tell you how many times when I've witnessed to someone, they, oh, you know, I, I used to go to church all the time. You know, I, I'd go to Sunday school. Um, okay. But what are you doing now? Uh, so many people want to try to look back to something, some experience they had in the, in the past. But those who are truly Christ abide in the truth. And believers not only have the Son, but they have the Father. Thank God we have access to the Father. And even though Jesus is the exclusive way, there couldn't be a more beautiful and wonderful way than through Jesus. In the last section, um, in verses 10 and 11, John gives us a, a hard teaching. Believers avoid fellowship with deceivers. Scripture says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Now what John is not saying here is that we are to avoid completely anyone who's not a Christian, right? If that was the case, we couldn't fulfill the Great Commission, right? We're, we're called to go out to the world to preach the gospel. But what John is saying here is that you're not to have that intimate 
relationship with the darkness. And that goes for those outside of the church or those preaching that false gospel. Light has no fellowship with darkness. And so often you might have the best of intentions. I'm, I'm going to become this person's best friend and, and, and I'll win them over. But too many times the opposite has happened. You know, there's many things in this world that I find offensive. Um, you know, Paul often lists off these vice lists, fornication, disobedience to parents, lying, thieves, so on and so forth. But the thing I find most offensive above everything else are those who promulgate false teaching. Prosperity gospel teachers who teach another gospel, another Christ. You know, if it's just an atheist, you know, you can expect their message to be against Christ. But someone who proclaims to be a follower, who names the name of Christ, but then slips in their poison into a church to destroy it or to give you even worse a false sense of security you know one of the most terrifying sections in scripture is in john chapter 7 when jesus said many will come to me on that day on judgment day and say lord lord did i not do all these things i mean i had these religious experiences of course i'm a follower and jesus says i never knew you away from me worker of lawlessness you know when you see a pig and it rolls around in the mud and then it comes up and gets you dirty why would you be angry with it that's what a pig does a pig rolls around in the mud uh, I have to remind my wife my cat he's very annoying but it's because he's doing cat things that's what a cat does um, but false teachers, they are wolves in sheep clothing. They're not what they appear, and that's why we need to be on guard against them. Even Satan himself can appear as an angel of light. And Peter, who was on the mount and saw Jesus in his full glory, he had that eyewitness experience with his own eyes he saw the glory of Christ and yet he says in scripture we have a more sure testimony to the truth so that's how we can know the truth from the lie is by studying God's word and clinging to that and that alone and the last thing I want to look at this morning is John's farewell in verses 12 and 13 Scripture says, fellowship in truth and love uh, brings an abundance of joy. Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made full and the children of your chosen sister greet you. So fellowship in the truth brings an abundance of joy. Here John says, I have so much more I want to, to say to you. I want to love you. I want to build you up and encourage you. I'm not going to do it on paper and ink. I just wanted to send this to you quickly, but I want to come and speak to you face to face. Why? He says that your joy may be full. I don't have to convince anybody here that face-to-face that -face fellowship with other believers brings an abundance of joy. I mean, how amazing is it these past few weeks we've been able to, to come back together and worship the Lord together. There really is no substitute. And so I want to encourage you with this. 
those who are here at Faith Baptist Church, walk in the truth, walk in the light. Don't just possess, seek that head knowledge, but seek to live out that knowledge in your life. And we do so by loving others the way Christ loved us. Recall Jesus said, no greater love is this that when a man lays down his life for his friends. That's the kind of love that we need to have for each other. We have an opportunity to encourage one another and build each other up. All of us have been given spiritual gifts and your spiritual gift was not given for you. It was given so that you could serve other people. And scripture tells us not to neglect the assembling of ourselves together. To do so would only be picking our own pockets. We're robbing ourselves of joy and peace and love. God created us to be relational beings, not only to be in relationship with him, but also with one another. And I pray this morning that we would be united together in this shared love, that we would humble ourselves before the God of Scripture, and that we would serve each other. Let us pray. Dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, you are so awesome. Lord, none of us deserve to be called your son or daughter. But you provided a way for us when there was no way by sending your son to die upon the cross for our sins. And that invitation, Lord, is available today. Today is the day of salvation. Lord, you have not promised another day, another hour of life to any of us. No one knows when our time is called. And I pray that everyone here today knows you as Lord and Savior, but if anyone does not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would call them to lead them up and that we can share the good news of the gospel. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray, amen.